Uh, today, I have the great privilege and honor of introducing one of my friends and colleagues, Dr. Della Silvera, who's a native of McLean, Virginia, so a local hometown hero. Uh, went to Potomac School, was captain of her tennis and basketball teams, uh, completed undergrad at Yale, uh, and then received her medical degree at Stanford University, and then trained, uh, most importantly, in uh, emergency medicine here at MedStar Georgetown. Um, she completed an additional sports medicine fellowship in 2012 at Fairfax Inova. She's double boarded in emergency medicine and sports medicine. And uh, for anybody who's on any type of leadership call at MedStar knows that she wears many hats here. Uh, she's the medical director of MedStar's health urgent care and oversees 14 urgent care sites with over 170 providers. And, I really can't emphasize how important that has been throughout the pandemic. This has been the place where we refer our people to get uh, testing for COVID. Um, and it's just been a huge, huge resource um, as we all work together on this. Um, in addition, she runs a sports medicine practice for MedStar Sports Medicine in the DC region. She is the founder and program director of MedStar's Primary Care Sports Medicine Fellowship and serves on our Georgetown University Medical School faculty. Uh, she's been a key participant in the development of standardized protocols and guidelines for MedStar Health Sports Medicine Concussion Program to ensure uniformity across our system. She serves as the head primary care ER team physician for the Washington Capitals, go Caps. Um, and today she will talk to us about focused orthopedics, a royal pain in the back and what a pain in the neck. Um, so Liz, thank you so much for coming to speak to us today. Awesome. Thanks, Sean, for that intro. Uh, just to, to preface this, this is two uh, kind of shorter talks on musculoskeletal neck and back pain that I tend to give to ER urgent care providers uh, and some, uh, you know, sports med providers in the beginning of fellowship. I combine them into one talk. Uh, instead of inter in, in putting the slides kind of all into one, I decided to start off with neck and then we'll transition to back and you can ask questions in between. Um, so each of them kind of have their own little roadmaps or agendas. Uh, so as far as neck pain, let's start with that. Uh, here's our roadmap of what we're going to talk about in the next 20 or 30 minutes while we go through neck pain before transitioning to back. We're going to talk about degenerative disc disease, radiculopathy, and myelopathy, all causes of non-traumatic neck pain. Let's start off with degenerative disc disease. So first, what is a disc? Um, I like to tell patients that it's kind of like a shock absorber or a tire, the kind of that gel-like tire between the two bones, both in our, we, we have them obviously throughout our whole spine. Uh, there's a fibrous cartilage uh, kind of outer layer and, and more of a gel-like inner layer when you look at the discs in cross-section. Sorry about that. Uh, what can go wrong with discs? So this picture I think is very telling. You can see the picture of a normal disc, which is that gel-like tire between the bones uh, with its normal height and size. Your disc can degenerate, and so you get kind of like that Swiss cheese appearance of your disc, and it's just not as strong as it used to be. It can bulge or it can herniate out of its normal spot, and I think these pictures show that very clearly. Uh, it can thin or become uh, kind of that tread on your tires has worn down. And as that happens, um, like other, other um, things that happen throughout the body when there's um, arthritis or loss of cartilage or loss of that padding between bones, uh, we develop osteophytes. Um, and you can see that lower down in the picture. So again, this is another depiction that I often show patients uh, that you think about those, those discs like tires and you got good tread on your new Firestone tires that you just got. And over time, as you use them, uh, they kind of wear down and they thin and then they start to ankylose or, or, or become, uh, develop osteophytes and other problems. So degenerative disc disease is kind of a misnomer because it's really not a disease, right? It's a typical normal aging process. So as we all get older, as Sean has a birthday today and turns 21, uh, his disc may be degenerating over time, and this is not a disease. This happens to everybody. Uh, typically non-surgical, or else we'll be doing a lot of surgeries that we don't need to do. And part of, the, part of this talk is to talk about who needs surgery and who doesn't for each of these entities, and we'll get into that next. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, it's usually your patient that comes in with uh, atraumatic musculoskeletal neck pain, no radiculopathy, so in other words, no radiation down the arms, um, mostly midline pain, and it's almost always above the shoulders or definitely above the shoulder blades. And we'll, we'll talk about with radiculopathy how often you get uh, pain in a pretty dermatomal distribution, and oftentimes it kind of goes into those, uh, that, that kind of like lower shoulder blade region or lower into that up, upper thoracic spine as well. This degenerative disc disease is going to be really more midline or upper pain. That's worse with activity or movement, and that movement can be as simple 
uh, as just you know turning from side to side, but it's usually worse with some sort of movement or activity. And, and on exam, they're gonna have a normal neurologic exam. So, so both subjectively, no numbness, tingling, weakness, but also objectively as well. Um, X-rays are helpful uh, for this diagnosis because you can confirm it, um, but they're not always needed. And, and throughout the course of this talk, we'll talk about when to get X-rays and when not to, um, but X-rays can confirm it. So, so what's the role of MRI? You're seeing someone in your office who's in their 50s, they've got midline neck pain, they've got no neurologic signs or symptoms. Uh, you get an X-ray, it shows some mild degenerative disc disease, maybe an osteophyte at C5, C6, C6, C7, something like that. When do you need to get an MRI? Well, this study I thought was helpful because the MRI is probably not gonna help you much. Uh, most people over 40, actually, if you get an MRI, are gonna have disc degeneration, even with no pain. Um, so if, if over half the people in the world have this on MRI without any pain, how are you gonna know if that's the cause of their pain or not? So, so how is the MRI gonna change what you do? Um, so it's fairly rare that we're gonna need to get an MRI, uh, especially because this is just so prevalent in the population. But when do I get an MRI? I, I would say if I've, if I've treated someone conservatively, uh, and, and we'll talk about what that conservative treatment would be, uh, for over six weeks and they're not getting better, um, then I'd wanna make sure I'm not missing something. And again, um, to, to, to help me confirm the diagnosis, although it's not completely confirmatory because you can see this in people without pain. If I'm worried about something beyond just degenerative disc disease, so they have some sort of red flag, radic radiculopathy, myelopathy, and we're gonna go into those diagnoses a little more. Um, and then as a roadmap for an injection, so someone's not getting better, they've done all the conservative things that I can do as a non-interventionalist and a non-spine uh, injection specialist, and I want to send them to someone to do an injection, um, then I need a roadmap for that. So I really need to hone in on what's the level that's bothering them the most, and an MRI can be helpful with that. And again, if I'm unsure of the diagnosis, it can maybe point me in one direction or the other, but because half the people have this without pain really isn't going to give you the, the, the um, exact answer, but it can be helpful as part of your workup. So what is that initial conservative treatment? Uh, strengthening, stretch, stretching, and treating the musculature, you can't fix the bones, right? So, so we, can't, we can't make that degenerative disc or that tread on the tires come back, but it's usually the muscles that tighten up around that uh, in relation to that uh, arthritic component or that, that degenerative disc that cause the problem. So if I can fix the muscles, I can usually fix the pain. Um, Chiropractor, I'm a little bit plus minus on, uh, and we can get into that in a little more detail if we want to, but I usually start with physical therapy. Uh, they can do things like dry needling, which you'll see at the bottom of this slide, which I think can be really helpful at relaxing those muscles. And they can work on things like chin tucks and some soft tissue techniques that can really uh, work out some of the issues with those muscles. I, I also think a lot of this is ergonomics and the way that we position our desk and the way that we sit. And so, so you can't, if, if you go send them to PT and they feel better when they leave PT, but then every day when they go to work, their symptoms come back, someone's got to evaluate their workspace. Uh, and so, so most offices have someone that could do that for them, um, or you can give them some, some advice in that realm. Uh, NSAIDs, muscle relaxants, you can add uh, topical treatments like lidoderm patches can also be helpful. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of muscle relaxants. I tend, I tend to, to only use them when I have to because they just make your whole body tired, not just, not just help your neck. Um, but these are all the kind of conservative treatment, which most of you guys know. I think the big thing is always think about the ergonomics and see what's, what, what tends to trigger their symptoms throughout the day. And then the secondary treatment, like I said, six weeks not improving, still really affecting their quality of life. <clears throat> I would try an NSAID at that point, assuming there's no contraindication. Uh, if that's still not working, that's when you're going to think, and you've done both trigger point injections in the office as well as dry needling with PT that's when you're gonna to start to think about a deeper injection, like an epidural steroid injection. And that's when I get the MRI as a roadmap uh, to, to make sure one, I haven't missed anything, and two, as a roadmap for, for my interventionalist. And surgery being the last resort, and that would be a fusion. So in summary, uh, uh, neck pain, uh, as far as operative versus non-operative, about 70%, so if you, had, if you had 100 people with degenerative disc disease that presented at the office, uh, at least 70 of them uh, would improve um, with, with conservative treatment. And, and there's also a 70% improvement in those that have surgery. So, so if you have 100 people that get surgery, 70 of them will improve and 30 of them won't. So, so why would you really send someone to surgery for this if the outcome is the exact same? You don't have to go through a surgery to, to get that outcome. So surgery should be highly selective. And, and also you need to think about if you have multiple level degenerative disc disease, um, that's really a not a good candidate for surgery. The typical good candidates for surgery are ones that have a clear level so if you took 100 people and, and, and the ones that had a clear level are going to be in that 70% that do better, if there's multiple levels, they're, they're probably going to be a setup for, for failure of, of, of surgical treatment. 
So overall summary of DDD or degenerative disc disease, pain above the shoulder blades and usually actually above the shoulder, usually um, kind of midline or at the neck and, not, and definitely not radiating down the arms. Almost always treat non-surgically. I would only get an MRI and think about referral to a specialist if there's intractable pain despite conservative treatment, greater than six weeks of treatment despite that conservative treatment, or if I'm worried about something else. Uh, they've got some signs of myelopathy and we're gonna talk about that and that's, that's a really huge part of this talk, um, or some radiculopathy that, that um, shows up later. Okay, so we've talked about degenerative disc disease. Let's move into cervical radiculopathy. So cervical radiculopathy means that they have pain that radiates from the neck down the arm. It can be associated with weakness and or just paresthesias and or shooting pain. And it's usually from that nerve root irritation that starts at the neck and then goes down the arm. Uh, usually the symptoms and signs correspond to a nerve root. So if somebody says they've got uh, numb, numbness tingling in their thumb versus numbness tingling in their pinky and, and part of their ring finger, you can usually figure out what dermatome it's coming from. In addition, where they point to the pain can also help. So you can see this dermatomal pattern of where the pain often comes in the, that back part of the neck or the traps and shoulder blade area. Uh, it kind of usually matches their symptoms. So we can usually figure this out on exam alone. Um, of course, you need to look for any sort of motor weakness and we'll talk about the exam in the slides to come. So there's, there's two main causes of cervical radiculopathy. One can be the tunnel where the nerve leaves called the foramen can narrow. And the other can be that the disc herniates and pushes out on the nerve root. And you can see both of those, those causes in this picture. This is taken from, uh, from, from a, a lumbar picture, but same, same concept uh, in the cervical spine. Depending on the age, uh, you can kind of guess which it's going to be. Um, discs are seen um, more, more often uh, in those less than 40. So this is, this is people that had MRIs of their cervical spine with no symptoms. And you can see disc herniations uh, in about 10%, but foraminal stenosis in about 4%. Those over 40, it flipped. So foraminal stenosis is from degenerative changes. So that kind of makes sense, right? So as you get older, it's more likely that it's from some narrowing or degenerative changes. As you're younger, it's more likely it's from a disc. So on exam, what am I, what am I doing when I examine someone that comes in with cervical radiculopathy or, or symptoms of uh, pain radiating down their arm? Um, always checking their strength, but also checking their gait. And we'll talk about why that's important when we, when we look at myelopathy a little further. Uh, sensation, reflexes, and then some special tests that I'm going to go through as well. So what's my quick and dirty motor exam for these patients? Um, I always do a deltoid exam because that's looking at C5. And that's actually the most debilitating type of weakness you can get from cervical radiculopathy. So deltoid for sure. Um, biceps, because that hits C both C5 and C6. Triceps. And then finger flexors with uh, hand grip and then, then hand intrinsics. So having them, you know, separate their fingers, don't let me push them together. That's really, really easy and quick, right? Like deltoids, hold your arms up, biceps, triceps, have them go like this and push up against me, uh, uh, grip, grip my fingers, and then hand intrinsics. And that gives you all the important nerve roots of the cervical spine um, from a motor standpoint. There's lots of other things you can do as well, but you'll catch all the important nerve roots if you do that. From a sensory perspective, lateral deltoid, and then everything else is pretty much uh, on the hand. If you want to look at T1, you would do the axilla, but lateral part of the deltoid, and then the dorsal thenar web space, the pointer and middle finger, and then the ulnar side of the hand, and then you can get all the important uh, sensory as well. So remember, deltoid in hand, from a sensory perspective and from a motor perspective, deltoid, biceps, triceps, and then uh, your hand strength. So special tests, I think almost everyone on this call would know the spurling uh, sign or spurling exam, uh, putting some axial load onto the head and then, and then rotating the head to the side of the symptoms. A positive test would be pain down the arm, uh, similar to a positive straight leg raise is pain down the leg past the knee. This is kind of like the straight leg test of, of the cervical spine. Um, a lot of patients will tell, will tell you, or if you ask, they get pain that shoots down their arm when they look uh, over their shoulder when driving um, or, or, or look in their rear view mirror, or turn their head a little bit. Uh, and they're kind of doing their own spurlings, right? They're doing that own maneuver without the axial load. Um, and so that can be telling that this is the underlying diagnosis. Um, this is called the adduction sign. So patients, I've had patients sit in the office and be talking to me and just, just hold their hand like this. Uh, and, and you can almost know right away what they have. Um, sometimes you just ask them, uh, do you feel better in this position? And they'll say yes. Um, but this is often something that kind of relieves their pain or decreases the pain in the arm. 
Uh, so when do we get x-rays for this diagnosis? I would get x-rays early on for this, and there's a few reasons. Um, one is because this is someone that's more likely going to need an MRI, and oftentimes we need an x-ray before getting an MRI for insurance purposes. Um, but it also helps us to try to localize which level this is happening at from, from degenerative changes seen on x-ray. When do we get an MRI? Well, it's not emergent. Uh, if there's weakness, I would get it early on because that's someone that's more likely going to be a surgical candidate and you don't want to uh, spin your wheels doing conservative treatment to get the MRI too late or down the road and de delay management. And we'll talk a little bit more about the management uh, in the slides to come. Um, but this MRI is not emergent. So in the ER and urgent care, we're always worried, do I need to send someone for an MRI today? Or can I wait? This one's definitely something that can wait. If it's pure cervical radiculopathy, so a, a compression of the branches of the tree, not the tree trunk, and we'll talk about the tree trunk when we talk about myelopathy and cauda equina and cord compression. Uh, if this is a, a pinch of a branch, this can wait. Um, but of course, it, it should happen. Uh, one, as a roadmap for an injection, as a roadmap if you need surgery to confirm the diagnosis, et cetera, but, but non-emergently. So what's the treatment of cervical radiculopathy? Um, NSAIDs, PO steroids, this is pretty painful. If any of you guys have had this, uh, quote, a pinched nerve in your back or your neck, um, it can be pretty painful. So I uh, tend to avoid narcotics, but I tend to put them on something to calm it down. Um, PO steroids uh, have controversy. There's, and we'll get into the literature a little bit more in the back pain um, talk because uh, the ER has a bunch of studies on, on PO steroids with lumbar radiculopathy. Um, I use them with caution, but I tend to use them in young, healthy individuals, no health. Well, no, no past medical history of diabetes, psych history, those kind of things, because you just don't want to exacerbate uh, anything underlying. Um, topicals, lidoderm tends to be helpful if they've got a lot of kind of trap pain. Physical therapy is the key here, uh, including that dry needling and other modalities. And then sometimes we do need to move to um, other injections, selective nerve root injections, epidurals, et cetera. As far as outcomes, 70% uh, of patients with cervical radiculopathy improve with time alone. So again, going back to that 100 patients you see, 70 of them, if you did nothing, they would get better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, only two out of 26 patients in this one study uh, uh, needed to be treated surgically. So, so less than 10%. And most studies say less than 10% need surgery. Um, there's still a subset of patients treated conservatively that have persistent or recurrent pain. Um, but generally, a rule of thumb is if you're seeing a patient in the office that has cervical radiculopathy, uh, you can tell them only about one in 10 people with this diagnosis need surgery. And a lot of patients come in and they're in such bad pain, they can't imagine that they, don't, that they, they would be able to get away without surgery or just time alone would improve them. But the reality is only one in 10 need surgery. And, and of course, those that do PT uh, usually get better faster. So who does need surgery? So again, that six week mark, recalcitrant symptoms after six weeks, that's someone you might think about surgery because the chance that they continue to get better is smaller. Uh, neurologic deficits, in particular, that C5 deltoid weakness, that can be really disabling. And if that becomes a chronic issue, um, can, make, can be a big patient dissatisfier. So if you see someone with deltoid weakness, C5 weakness, I would send them to a surgeon early. They may still follow them for a few weeks, but I would still send them early on. Uh, and, and of course, you want to make sure that what you're seeing on exam and what you're seeing historically matches your imaging. So if you're seeing someone that has some numbness, tingling in a certain cervical dermatomal pattern and your MRI does not match that, maybe we're missing something. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe the pinch on the branch is further down. Maybe that's when you want to get an EMG or, or think outside the box a little bit. So you wouldn't want to set someone up for surgery unless we're sure of the diagnosis. What are the goals of surgery? Well, it's to decompress that nerve root or to, to decompress that pinch on that branch so we can eliminate that nerve root irritation. So if it's a herniated disc that's causing the issue, uh, then we would try to eliminate that nerve root irritation from that herniated disc or do a partial discectomy. Okay, so summary of cervical radiculopathy. It's usually neck and arm pain, and, and often it's confused with a shoulder issue because they, they often present with pain on the posterior aspect of their shoulder or shoulder blade, uh, and a lot of patients come in saying their shoulder hurts. Um, we see that almost every day in the sports office, so something to keep in mind. Uh, it's usually treated uh, non-surgically, so remember one in 10 patients generally that walks in the office is gonna need surgery. Um, further evaluations or more urgent referral are needed with a C5 or deltoid weakness for sure, um, any persistent motor weakness, any signs of myelopathy, which is gonna go into our next slide, or failure of conservative treatment. So six weeks is kind of a line in the sand in the textbook. Uh, or if their symptoms are progressive or worsening despite using all the conservative measures you have in your toolkit. Okay, let's move on to cervical myelopathy. This is like the most important part of the talk. So 
if you're like me and you have a, like a very small attention span, this may be the part to pay attention to because this is the highest risk. So cervical myelopathy, it's a clinical syndrome that results from spinal cord compression. And, and the hardest part with this is it might be the least painful of these three. So uh, patients can come in with no pain with this and the, the symptoms and the signs are very subtle. Uh, whereas your patient with cervical radiculopathy and sometimes with degenerative disc, they're in a lot of pain and, and so they're, they're, they're not as subtle. But these patients sometimes present late or present with really subtle findings and we have to think outside the box uh, with these. So what are the, co the common symptoms? It's often clumsiness. So their handwriting has changed or they're dropping things or their balance is a little off. Sometimes they do have some sensory changes, but it's often in a non-dermatomal distribution. So instead of it being an obvious C5, C6 issue because of the area that they have loss sens of sensation, they'll just say different parts of my arm feel numb at different times. Um, they can get some motor weakness, but it's again, not often dermatomal. Sometimes they get the bowel or bladder dysfunction. Obviously, that's more of a red flag. Um, sometimes they just present with some occipital mild headaches, uh, heavy feeling in their legs. I can't walk as fast as I used to. Um, more trouble buttoning a shirt. Um, and then again, neck pain is rare. Some stiffness sometimes, but often they don't have neck pain. So a lot of times we're not thinking about the neck. We're thinking about something else. And I'll go into a case at the end where a very good ER clinician uh, thought of a lot of other things and ruled those out, but, but didn't think of this on the first visit because it is really tricky. So here's a picture. Uh, you can see the, the cord edema here. You can see um, the degenerative disc, large osteophytes that's led to um, pinching of the cord. Um, that CSF, that, that area around the cord, once that starts to get pinched uh, and you're moving really close to the cord, um, that's when you have to start to, to be concerned. And obviously this one has already pinched the cord and, and led to some cord edema. So what are some red flags or things to keep in mind? So if you're seeing some elderly patient that has had multiple falls, um, oftentimes, at least in the ER and urgent care, we're blindsided by the fracture. We treat what's in front of us, right? So that second or third visit with the second or third fracture, start to think what's going on here, right? And, and maybe there's another cause of the ataxia. There's lots of causes of, of ataxia or clumsiness, right? But, but this is something we don't wanna miss, so always keep it in your differential. So what are we looking for on exam? Um, hyperreflexia, clonus, uh, numbness, abnormal gait, so difficulty with heel toe walking, and that's why any musculoskeletal complaint that has to do with the spine, I always have them walk. Uh, grip and release testing, we'll talk about Hoffman's, we'll talk about Lermite sign, myelopathy hands, Babinski, these are all things that you can do on your exam if you have this concern. So Lermite sign is, uh, is basically when you have them touch their chin down to their chest, uh, you kind of uh, uh, flex their neck and like the, seen in this picture, and, and pain that, that shoots down the spine, not just as a stretch in the neck, but pain that shoots down the spine like a shock-like sensation would be a positive Lermite sign with this motion. And, and, and just, just to clarify, that, that would be a sign of some sort of myelopathy. Um, Hoffman sign, it's elicited by, by tapping the, the nail of the middle finger and looking for the reflex contraction of the thumb and index finger. So um, if you haven't ever done this or haven't ever seen it, it's worth looking online at the, at the physical exam of someone doing this. Um, but it's a, really, um, it, it's a really sensitive exam finding. Uh, 16 patients without neck pain or radiculopathy who were seen in the office for various uh, uh, mild neurologic or subtle neurologic things who had a positive Hoffman's were prospectively studied with an MRI and all 16 um, had signs of myelopathy on their MRI. So, so this is something that you should incorporate into your physical exam with these patients. Myelopathy hands, you can see uh, the, this, the, the, this patient has one hand that looks more atrophied than the other. Um, this is just a sign of, of something going on upstream um, that's leading to this atrophy of the hand downstream. So what are the common causes of myelopathy? Uh, the, os the ossified posterior longitudinal ligament, otherwise known as OPLL uh, in a lot of the literature, is a common cause. 25% of patients with cervical myelopathy had this as the cause in, in a few different studies. Uh, that's more commonly seen in patients that are younger, kind of in their mid 40s or 50s with evidence of myelopathy. So if you just honed in on that age group, it would be a significantly higher proportion. Uh, on MRI or CT, you can see this as basically an area of ossification or, or coalescence behind the cervical vertebral bodies. And, and because of that calcification behind the bones, it leads to compression of the CSF and then eventually compression of the cord. Other causes, discs, uh, 
large osteophytes, like was in that um, MRI. Tumors, of course, rare but deadly. Um, all things to keep in mind that can cause cervical myelopathy. So what's the treatment and the workup? So this is someone that does need a STAT MRI. So if there was somebody I was seeing uh, in the office or in urgent care, I would probably send them for an MRI same day. Uh, in the ER, it would be one of those rare events where we get an MRI from the ED. Uh, if, there's, if there's a contraindication to an MRI, you'd get a CT myelogram, such as a pacemaker, et cetera. And then this is somebody that, while cervical radiculopathy might be an outpatient consult for recalcitrant symptoms or even with C5 deltoid weakness, I might send to someone in a week or two after the imaging is done. This is someone that gets an immediate consultation to a surgeon, either a neurosurgery or orthospine. So what's the natural history of cervical myelopathy? 75% uh, have kind of a episodic but stepwise worsening. 20% have a slow progression. And 5% have a really rapid onset of symptoms and a lengthy disability. So this is something you don't want to miss. I have the picture of the train here because um, and, and also you'll see that Georgetown Ortho little icon at the top of these slides. I should have mentioned earlier that these slides were made in conjunction with Dr. Kalantar a while back when we were presenting to a group of primary care. Um, he, he, he uses this analogy that, that your train is still in the station um, when, when you see some compression of the CSF without compression of the cord. So if you get an MRI and you see that CSF is indenting from an osteophyte disc formation or from a herniated disc, but the cord has no edema and there's no compression of the cord and there's no symptoms of myelopathy, that's someone you might want to refer early so they can continue to follow and they can continue to counsel that patient on things to look out for because that's when the train's still in the station hasn't left. But when the train has left the station and they've fallen three times and they've had fractures and their cord has that edema, sometimes this stuff is irreversible. And so that's how he describes it. And so I thought I'd bring this up with the, with the train image. So surgery is the most effective thing to halt the progression. Uh, recovery of function uh, is less predictable. It's better with younger patients. It's better with a shorter duration and it's better with less severity. So again, catch this before it's gotten to a longer duration and more severe. Okay, so in summary, cervical myel myelopathy is more of a functional disorder with that change in handwriting, balance changes, I can't button my shirt, those kind of things. And there's often no pain or mild pain. So it's gonna be a less dramatic presentation to that cervical radiculopathy patient. And we really need to refer early to a surgeon and get an MRI right away so that train doesn't leave the station. Okay, so we made it through the roadmap of, of the cervical stuff. Um, let's just go through a quick algorithm. And this comes from Dr. Kalantar of things that are least urgent, but more common. So don't need to refer, you guys, we can all handle this to, to most urgent and least common. And it kind of goes in this order, right? So neck pain only, midline, degenerative changes, most of the time, no urgency, not much to do, very rarely surgical. Uh, neurosymptoms or signs, mild radiculopathy, no deficit, and then go on down. Cervical myelopathy or severe radiculopathy with progressive or severe weakness, those are the things that we want to refer early, and those are more urgent. So in conclusion, Degenerative disc disease, neck pain only, rarely surgical, get x-rays, and these can be followed and almost all do well with non-surgical options. Think about things like ergonomics and things that are worsening the symptom. Radiculopathy, uh, again, rarely surgical, but early imaging can be important to confirm the diagnosis and to help as a roadmap for injections. If there's deltoid weakness, think about an early referral, uh, and, and most of these patients do well with conservative management as well. Myelopathy is the thing we can't forget and the train can't leave the station. Uh, be really aware of these subtle findings, heavy legs, occipital headaches, clumsiness. If you're seeing someone that falls a lot, think about that. Ossified ligaments can happen in that 40 to 50 year old range. More commonly in the elderly population, it's from discs or osteophyte formation, less likely tumor, but don't forget about that as well. And MRIs and consultations to be more emergent in these cases. So I'm going to end with a case. Like I said, we had a, we, this was a case that I saw in, in the ED uh, as a, as a um, second visit. Um, and I don't blame anyone in this case. These were really hard. Um, but I thought I'd use it just to highlight uh, how subtle these can be and how we can often anchor on other things. So 73-year-old male, history of hypertension, BPH, chronic back pain, diabetes, came to the ER for balance issues with multiple falls. And it was that fall today that brought them in. And he had a few episodes of urinary incontinence, but it didn't seem like with his BPH and his age, he'd had those before. So that didn't seem to be a red flag to them. They really brought him in uh, because of this fall. 
they not a no, they note a non-focal neural exam neuro exam they talk about bph subdural cauda equina etc they got labs urine head ct l spine x-ray actually ended up getting an l spine mri given the incontinence and history of chronic back pain and falls all that was okay i mean there were some subtle findings but nothing emergent and he went home with his family because all that was unremarkable he returned to the ER three weeks later with progressive numbness and weakness in his legs and more falls. The attending there noted some bilateral leg weakness and some gait instability on their exam. He ended up getting full MRI, brain and full spine, because I think no one really knew what was going on. And he had this large cervical disc herniation pushing on the cord with edema. So he had cervical myelopathy. He had surgery the next day. He had a prolonged inpatient stay with PT and he's discharged at this point. Um, but I thought this was a good case to just highlight how subtle this can be and how we can think brain and we can think back. Uh, but sometimes we just forget about the cervical spine. Um, and this is really an important case to highlight that. So um, I was going to move on to back, but I thought I would look, uh, Sean, if there's any questions in the chat uh, so we can compartmentalize questions from neck to back. Um, any questions so far on neck? Right now we're all clear, but you know, I'd, I'd certainly echo what you said where we see people who they've got say terrible rheumatoid arthritis and suddenly they're having difficulty walking and people attribute it all to their arthritic problems. And it turns out that it's actually a cervical spine myelopathy. Yep, uh, I agree. Several I mean, of those per year. Me too. And, and, and it's unfortunate. I totally get why it happens because we anchor on other things, but it's just really important to keep this in mind. And then for any of the trainees, these are the kinds of questions that always show up on, on all of our boards. So paying yep. attention. Good, good point. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to, to back. If any questions come up with the neck, feel free to put them in the chat and we can get to them at the end. Um, so with the back lecture, I'm gonna start off by with four cases that I've seen either in sports, in sports medicine clinic or in the ER. Uh, case number one is a 32-year-old male. He came in with right leg pain and numbness, which he described as a shock-like pain from his buttock down his right leg after picking up a box while moving. He said it's worse with bending, better with laying flat or in the fetal position. You ask him about all the red flags because you know all the things to ask, and he has none of those. On exam, he has a negative straight leg raise, but a positive seated slump test on the right. When you examine his right leg, he's got four out of five plantar flexion strength and a decreased Achilles reflex, and he's got a hard time walking on his tiptoes on the right side. So keep these cases in mind. We're going to get back to them at the end. Case number two is a 16-year-old male baseball player who came to the ER because he's got severe right-sided low back pain after a full day of pitching. And he said it started with just tightening up, but it's now severe and he's having trouble walking. It's worse when he extends or arches his back. Uh, for example, when he's pitching, uh, it, he's got no radiation of the pain, no numbness, tingling, no red flags. And other than being really tight, his back is tight, his hamstrings are tight, and he really doesn't want to extend his back. He's kind of sitting hunched over. His exam is otherwise normal. Case number three, see this, this kind of stuff this time of year. People that come from whitetail, 22-year-old male snowboarder, does a trick and lands on his back and has got severe low back pain with nausea. He's got no neurologic symptoms, no numbness, tingling, no weakness, no bowel or bladder symptoms. He's got midline L1 to 2 pain and some mild abdominal tenderness, but otherwise his exam is normal. And last case, case number four, is an unfortunate case of someone I saw in the ED, 63-year-old female who's got renal cell cancer, who comes in and her chief complaint actually was rib pain. It was posterior rib pain, low back pain, but she's also got some tingling in her right leg. And then when you ask her, she says, yes, I'm constipated. She's also on some narcotics, and so she just equated it to that, but she's had no bowel movement in five days. She's got some difficulty ambulating, and it's unclear if it's due to pain or due to weakness. But when you really hone in on her right leg, you feel like it's weak, and she's got an absent Achilles reflex on that right side. Okay, so a roadmap of what we're going to talk about for the next 20 minutes or so when it comes to the back. We'll go through some basic anatomy and exam for the lumbar spine. We'll talk about how I, lower, I narrow down my differential diagnosis, and we'll take a closer look at certain diagnoses, so spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis, lumbar radiculopathy, lumbar fractures, the, 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 the terrible cauda equina, just like we talked about cervical myelopathy. We have to focus on that and then get back to the cases. So let's go into some anatomy and exam for the lumbar spine. So this is a picture of the, bo the bony anatomy from the posterior aspect. The spinous processes are the things you can palpate on yourself. The transverse processes are like the wings to the side of those spinous processes. Uh, the facet joints are the things that articulate in that posterior part of the bony spine when you, when you arch your back. The pars interarticularis is like the, the neck of a Scotty dog, and we'll, we'll look at that on, a, on an x-ray picture. But it's the thing that connects your, your um, transverse process to your lamina. It's just like a, a, a little 
area that can take a lot of stress when you arch your back. And then you can see your sacrum and your coccyx coming on down. When you look a little deeper into the anatomy of the spine, uh, you can see your, your lumbar vertebral bodies here in cross section as well as the disc. We talked about the disc in the cervical talks. So we're not going to talk too much about that, but you can see where the discs kind of articulate or come close to that cauda equina or that horse's tail. And as you all know, the, the spinal cord ends at about L1. And so from L2 on down, it's really that horse's tail or that cauda equina. As far as exam for the lumbar spine, uh, here's something that I teach all my fellows is a way to think of any MSK complaint, always go through these six steps. So inspection, palpation, range of motion, strength, neurovascular, and special tests. And if you do that with every MSK thing, an ankle, uh, a shoulder, a knee, a back, you really won't miss anything if you go through these six steps. So inspection, palpation, range of motion are fairly straightforward. So I'm not going to go into too many details about those, but remember these six steps, especially for the trainees when you're going through your MSK exam. But I am going to talk about the strength neurovascular and special test component um, when it comes to the lumbar spine. So first, uh, the, the strength, the strength and uh, uh, neurovascular component. This is a really complicated table and I don't expect you to memorize, but this goes through um, what's the sensory reflex and, and muscular component that goes with each lumbar dermatome. But if, if you really wanna hone in on this and kind of have a, a, a quick and dirty, uh, from a sensory perspective, when you're seeing someone with um, a back complaint, always do a sensory exam that includes kind of the saddle, groin region, the thigh and the foot. Always do a motor exam that includes the hip, so flexion extension, the knee flexion extension and the ankle dorsi, plantar flexion, eversion, inversion. Do your patellar and Achilles reflexes and have them walk so you can check their gait, just regular gait, but then have them walk on tiptoes and heels. So this is kind of what I teach all my, my trainees and my fellows and, and how uh, we go through it. You don't have to memorize this table, but just memorize that bottom line. Uh, sorry, I just skipped something real quick. One second. Okay, so um, special tests, uh, straight leg raise, seated slup, Gainsland, Faber, and then Stork or facet loading are the special tests I want you to remember when it comes to the lumbar spine. There's others, but these are the main ones I want you to focus on. As far as the straight leg raise, you guys probably all know how to do this. The question is, do you know what a positive is and do you know what the sensitivity is? Um, so this is a picture of someone doing a straight leg raise. It's like a hamstring stretch. You have them lay on their, on their back and, and, and stretch their hamstring. A positive test would be pain that radiates down the leg past the knee on that side. The sensitivity is 52%, specificity 80 to 90%. A seated slump test on the other hand is a better test. I still do both, but it's a better test for lumbar radiculopathy. So a seated slump test has a sensitivity of 84%, whereas, whereas the straight leg rate had 52, and a similar specificity. So you have the patient sit on the exam table with their legs dangling off so their knees are in a flex position. You're going to flex their chin down to their chest and have them put their arms kind of behind their body like is shown in this picture. Uh, and then you're going to passively raise the leg, in this case the left leg, and pain that radiates down the leg past the knee will be a positive test. If you then relax their neck, the pain should dissipate or decrease. And that's because you're decreasing that pull, that neural tension that you're, that you're bringing on by, by flexing their neck. So this is a really good test, and I use this a lot when someone has any sort of signs or symptoms of lumbar radiculopathy. Uh, Gainsland and Faber are both looking for the sacroiliac joint to be the cause of pain. Uh, in this case, this patient may come in with right low back pain or right buttock pain. You feel like it's isolated to the SI joint. You would put their right knee hanging off the exam table. You need to make sure your exam table is raised up high enough so that way the foot is not hitting the ground. Uh, and you push that knee down towards the ground while taking the other knee and bringing it up towards their body. And a positive test would be pain in the right SI joint with this test. A Faber or a figure four test also looking for SI joint pain. So again, this patient would come in with pain in the right side of their back. You think it might be the SI. You take that right leg and you put it into a figure four position. You support their other hip uh, with, your, with your left hand and you push down on their, on their right knee uh, towards the exam table or towards the ground and pain in the right SI joint would be a positive test. Stork or facet loading is really an extension-based maneuver. I tend to brace the patient when I do this, but I, basically you're just extending their back or arching their back, and you're looking to see if they have pain in the low back with this test. And pain in the low back with this test would be more indicative of something like a stress fracture, which we'll get into, or facet degenerative changes. Okay, let's talk about how we narrow down the differential diagnosis. So here's a huge laundry list of causes of non-traumatic low back pain, uh, degenerative disc, facet, DJD, ankylosing spondylitis, et cetera. So when we have this huge list, how do we narrow it down? 
Well, a few things I keep in mind. So degenerative disc or facet DGD or arthropathy, this is gonna be similar to your uh, uh, degenerative disc of the, of the neck. So midline pain, non-radiating, often in an older patient, usually worse with movement, in particular extension, um, and, and often waxes and wanes or comes and goes. Ankylosing spondylitis, on the other hand, that could be someone that has a lot of morning stiffness, often a younger patient, and as they warm up and as they go, tends to get better. Spinal stenosis, often in your older patient, worse with walking, better with leaning forward or that so-called grocery cart sign. SI joint pain, um, often more unilateral, buttock or posterior, seen a lot in females, peri-pregnancy, um, but also can be seen in males. Uh, on exam, your Faber or your Gainsland can point you in that direction. Tumor or infection, constitutional symptoms worse at night, present at rest, risk factors for this, always things you need to keep in mind. And a hematoma would be rare, but in someone that's anticoagulated, had a recent procedure or trauma, you can consider that. And of course, you never want to forget about the non-musculoskeletal causes of back pain. So I can't tell you how many times I've had a resident or a med student see a patient and they think their back pain is coming from their SI joint or, or maybe it's coming from something muscular. And then you go look at their skin and they have shingles. So um, always think about AAA, kidney stones, pyelonephritis, dissection, shingles, all these other things you always need to think about when you're seeing these patients. As far as traumatic overuse causes of back pain, um, spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis, acute herniated disc, compression or other lumbar fractures, and then of course the non-musculoskeletal causes in this category, renal contusion, RP bleed, you can't, you can't uh, forget about as well. These three diagnoses we're gonna hone in on in a little more detail because I figured these might be things you don't see as often or haven't thought of recently so we could talk about. Before I get to that, I'm gonna um, put one slide out there about will x-rays help? Um, so this is, uh, Dr. Lin is an amazing EM physician at UCSF, and she really simplifies things for us in the literature. Uh, and these were her rules based on kind of uh, looking at retrospective and prospective studies. So will x-rays help when someone's seeing you for their first visit for back pain? The answer is yes, if they fall into these categories. Uh, extremes of age, uh, less than 18, over 50. I might say over 65, but it depends on, on how uh, familiar you are with the patient. Uh, in the ED, we say over 50 because we don't have that ability to follow up. Uh, if you're concerned about something like ankylosing spondylitis, uh, spondylolisthesis, like a stress fracture, concern for malignancy, night sweat, weight loss, history of cancer, and then more advanced imaging is often needed. Trauma with any bone tenderness, any concern for infection, that again would be not just x-rays, but likely more advanced imaging any neurologic deficits or signs or symptoms of cauda equina, again, more advanced imaging, but may start with an x-ray, or symptoms for more than four to six weeks. So really keep this in mind that there's a lot of categories of patients that you're not going to get an x-ray on in your first or second visit. Uh, if the symptoms are persistent and they come back, you might at that time. Okay, so let's take a little closer look at some of these diagnoses, spondylolysis, spondylolisthesis, herniated disc, fracture, and cauda equina, and then we'll get back to those cases we talked about at the beginning. So spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis. A spondylolysis is going to be a stress fracture of that pars interarticularis, and the listhesis is when that stress fracture is bilateral and has some slippage or some movement. So this, this Scotty dog, this is a cartoon depiction of what you're seeing on x-ray, and I know it's a little hard to see, um, but you can imagine that this Scotty dog cartoon can be seen on this x-ray when you're looking at an oblique view. Uh, so this is often seen in like tennis players, volleyball players, people that are Approaching their back a lot, swimmers that do butterfly, um, they because of all that stress on their back that they're putting on their back when they extend their back, they can get a stress fracture on that neck of the Scotty dog, uh, and so that 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 uh, that area takes a lot of the stress, and they get a, a black line there on that oblique X-ray. You don't always have it, you don't always see it on X-ray, and so sometimes you need an MRI. But in an athlete with that does a lot of extension-based maneuvers that has extension-based pain, get an X-ray with oblique views look for the collar on that Scotty dog or that black line on their neck. If you don't see it and you still have a high suspicion, get an MRI, um, but keep this in mind. Uh, what about herniated discs? Well, th it's often a flexion or rotation event. It can be atraumatic, but it's usually some sort of minor event. Like, like somebody I saw yesterday was walking down the stairs and had just a really subtle trip and they grabbed the railing. And so they kind of rotated their back. And then all of a sudden they come in with uh, low back pain that shoots down their leg past their knee. Again, people that are moving, lifting boxes, et cetera, it's a, it's a common mechanism. Um, it's usually worse with things that load the disc. So if they've been sitting for a while and they stand up, uh, they often have trouble in cars due to the, both the, the sitting for a while and the vibration. Um, coughing, sneezing, laughing, Valsalva all tend to make this worse. So those are really good questions to ask your patients. 
Um, patients often describe that it's better when they lay on their side or in the fetal position. So again, uh, ask your patients about these historical uh, uh, points. Um, L4 and L5 and L5-S1 account for 95% of the herniated disc in the back. So if you're seeing someone that's got pain with riding in the car, pain with coughing and sneezing, pain down their leg, uh, you're going to be right you know, 95% of the time if you tell them, I think you have an L4, L5 or an L5-S1 disc herniation, but you can actually usually hone, hone in on it on exam as well. So we use the term lumbar radiculopathy a lot uh, and cervical radiculopathy. W what does radiculopathy mean? Well, in, in the case of lumbar, it means pain in the back plus pain in the leg that radiates down past the knee or compression of that nerve root. And, and just like in <clears throat> cervical radiculopathy, there's a few causes. So foraminal stenosis or foraminal narrowing, just like in the neck, can cause it so that tunnel where the nerve root exits can become degenerative and you can get that push on that nerve. Um, uh, a herniated disc, we've already talked about, can cause it. Um, but so can spondylolisthesis, so you get that stress fracture with that slippage, it can then push on that nerve root, um, or overall spinal stenosis. So it, it sometimes doesn't just cause that typical lumbar radiculopathy in one dermatome, it can cause more of a diffuse type pain down the leg, um, but you can get similar type symptoms. Here's a picture of a disc herniation uh, that could cause that peripheral one that could cause um, radicular symptoms. Um, the, the, the central one, sorry, my slide let the, the words go down to the peripheral. So peripheral means, see that disc is herniating peripherally or outwardly and it's pushing on the nerve root. That nerve root is then gonna cause that radiculopathy down the leg. The, the, the disc that herniates centrally and puts on, pushes on the cord, like this picture that you see on the right-hand side of the slide, that's the one that can cause myelopathy or cauda equina. So that's the one just like with the cervical myelopathy that you really need to worry about. Here's a picture of lumbar radiculopathy, typical dermatome. So similar how we showed this in the cervical spine. Um, oftentimes patients who have like an S1 radiculopathy, they have pain kind of on that lateral uh, or posterior lateral aspect of their leg that goes down to the outside part of their foot. So what's the treatment for cervical radiculopathy? Well, similar to, uh, uh, sorry, for lumbar radiculopathy, typical, similar to cervical, rest, PT, NSAIDs, et cetera, Steroids or no steroids, here's two, here's two studies. Uh, one from Emergency Medicine Journal in 2015 showed that dexamethasone eight milligrams given in the ED made a, a shorter ED length of stay and their pain improved and had decreased acute pain scores uh, when surveyed. In JAMA, they looked at a prednisone taper and found that there was improved disability scores compared to placebo. So both of these studies are, sh show us that maybe steroids are helpful at decreasing pain. Um, I would also caution that there's some studies out there that show increased risk of fractures, DVTs, sepsis, uh, psychiatric uh, issues, hyperglycemia, et cetera. So again, I only use these in young, healthy individuals, no psych history, no diabetes, um, uh, no concern for complications. Uh, you would move to your injections only with uh, failure of conservative treatment and then surgery, just similar to, to the neck, progressive neurologic deficits, of course, any signs or symptoms of myelopathy or cauda equina, which we'll get to next, or any severe or persistent pain. Let's, let's transition a little bit to fractures. When you think about the spine, you have to think about it in three columns. The anterior column, which is gonna be the anterior two thirds of your vertebral body, as well as your anterior ligaments. Your middle column, which is gonna be that posterior one third of the vertebral body with some of the posterior ligaments. And then your posterior column, which is gonna be those facets, the lamina, the pars interarticularis, the spinous processes, and there's some other ligaments in the back as well. So remember the three columns are important when you think about fractures. Uh, lumbar compression or wedge fractures are often seen in the young healthy from trauma, uh, so like that snowboarder, and we'll get back to that case, or can be atraumatic in the older patients with osteoporosis or cancers, cancer. And these are, these are single column injuries. So when you see someone has a compression fracture or a wedge fracture, think of that as only one column is affected. It's a single column problem. Um, localized midline pain and neurologic symptoms are not always seen and are often rare, actually. So in this study, 240 out of 350 patients that had a lumbar compression fracture complained of pain more in their ribs, hip, groin, or buttock, and not necessarily just in their back. Uh, and most of these patients had no neurologic symptoms. So if you're waiting to get imaging, if you think someone could have a compression fracture based on their history, and you're waiting to get imaging because they don't have neurologic symptoms or their pain's not midline, you could be missing something. So what kind of imaging do we get in the ED or e or? For urgent care, if we're concerned about a compression fracture, uh, we'd start with an x-ray, and I'd always x-ray the T and the L spine. Um, so if I'm seeing that, that snowboarder that fell, and I think maybe has a compression fracture, 
even though his tenderness is maybe only lumbar, I'd still get the T-spine. Uh, a lot of compression fractures live in the lower T-spine and we miss them and multiple are often common and they're not always contiguous. So remember, uh, compression fractures like to go to the thoracic spine. Uh, when would I get a CAT scan? So if I had a high suspicion and I had, a, but I had a negative x-ray and I wanted to confirm the diagnosis or make sure I wasn't missing something, um, oftentimes there's also an associated intra-abdominal injury about 30% of the time. And so if I'm worried about another injury, then I might as well just start with a CT uh, and get the bony reconstructions on that CT. Um, if I get an x-ray and I see over a 50% loss of height on the x-ray or more than a 25 degree kyphosis, so that's something you can ask your radiologist to determine or you can help determine uh, based on the read. That's someone I get a CT on because then I'm worried maybe it's not just a compression fracture. Maybe it's multiple columns and not just one column that's affected. And I'd want to confirm that with advanced imaging. Uh, when would I get an MRI? Um, as you guys know, CT is better for bones. Uh, MRI would be better if I have a concern for any ligament disruption, cord edema, and that would be in someone with neurologic signs or symptoms. And sometimes these are done with dynamic x-rays and that would be up to your, your consultants at that point. So what's the treatment of a compression or wedge fracture? Um, these braces, these TLSO braces are commonly used, physical therapy, rarely surgical fixation is used and that's only for people with neurologic symptoms or ligament disruption, medical management for any underlying conditions that might've led to it like osteoporosis, and then an IR procedure like a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty could be used if someone has persistent pain. Other lumbar fractures. So burst fracture is a compression of the anterior and middle columns. And again, we don't need to go into the details, but these are more often surgical. So if you're worried about a two column injury because of that 50% loss of height or more kyphosis, that's why you wanna get a CT because a burst fracture would be treated differently. A chance fracture is something that involves all three columns. So either bony or ligamentous, Oftentimes these do have con concurrent abdominal injuries and again, more often surgical high levels of trauma. And then a transverse process or a spinous process fracture is almost always treated conservatively, conservatively not dangerous, but are related to trauma. Often missed on x-ray and often have concomitant abdominal or pelvic injuries. So if you're seeing someone that had trauma that has a transverse process or spinous fracture, do a really good exam and make sure you don't think they need a CT because they could have a concomitant injury. All right, let's shift to cauda equina. This is something we need to talk about in detail before we end. So this is seen in one in 2,000 patients with severe low back pain and one in 1,000 herniated discs. So I'd say that most of us as either primary care, ER, sports medicine physicians, will see 1,000 herniated discs in our career. So if we haven't seen cauda equina yet, either we've missed it or it's coming. Uh, what's the definition of cauda equina? Well, it's based on signs and symptoms, but one of the following has to be present. Bladder or bowel dysfunction, reduced sensation in the saddle area, or sexual dysfunction. I doubt most of us have asked about sexual dysfunction recently when we saw a patient with low back pain, so it's something we really have to keep in mind. What are the causes? One in two causes is a central disc. So that herniated disc that goes centrally, that goes in towards uh, the cord or, or towards where that cauda equina is, that's gonna be 50% of the time. The others are gonna be from more severe spinal stenosis and then hematoma, abscess, and tumor becoming more rare, but are also a possibility. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, if it's based on a constellation of signs and symptoms, we have to take a detailed history. We also have to do a good physical exam. So as far as what's our most important thing on physical exam, your post void residual, which we can do in the ED, you can't do as well in the office, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, that's gonna be your most sensitive exam finding. So we have people urinate, and then we measure their, their bladder volume. And if it's over 200 mLs of urine with the right history, um, that's more of a, that's a 90% plus sensitive exam finding for cauda equina. Rectal tone, less sensitive, uh, 60 to 80%, and then saddle anesthesia is somewhere in the middle at 75%. We have to get a stat MRI if we're concerned about this. Usually it's just the lumbar spine, but if you're concerned about malignancy, so, so just like compression fractures live in the thoracic spine, Malignancy lives in the thoracic spine. So if you're worried about malignancy, someone has a history or has constitutional signs or symptoms, do the T and L spine both. I've seen it more than once where someone got an L spine MRI for concern for cauda equina. It was clear they did not image the thoracic spine and later on they realized what they'd missed. Uh, if, if MRI is contraindicated, of course we go to a CT myelogram. And treatment is almost always surgical, but it's dependent on the cause. So, so if there's cancer, it could be radiation is the treatment, but time is nerve, and this is likely irreversible if symptoms last more than 48 hours. So this is not someone you're going to see in the office and send home. This is somebody that you really need to send to the ED for stat imaging and consultation, and make sure that you do a good sign-off so everybody's aware of what you're thinking.
Okay, so we've made it through our roadmap. Let's get back to those cases. So case number one was that 32 year old who was moving, who had pain down his right leg with a positive seated slump. So he has four out of five plantar flexion strength on the right and a decreased Achilles reflex on the right. And he has a hard time walking on his right tiptoes. So he's got lumbar radiculopathy, right? And he's got an S1 nerve root compression because he's got a diminished Achilles reflex and we know that's S1 and he can't walk on his tiptoes and we know that's S1. So we haven't even done any imaging and we know he's likely got an L5 S1 herniated disc on the right compressing the L S1 nerve root with mild weakness. So I'd get an x-ray because he's got some weakness. I'd get an urgent but not emergent MRI. And I'd think about surgical referral if he's not getting better and I'd send him to PT, et cetera. Case number two was that baseball player who did a lot of pitching and he's got some extension base pain and some tightness and otherwise has a normal exam. So he's got an overuse extension based injury without radiculopathy. So he's most likely got a stress fracture that's spondylolysis or spondylolisthesis. So you're gonna get an x-ray with obliques to look for that collar on the Scotty dog or the Scotty dog sign. And you're gonna have him rest from exercise and sports. If his x-ray is negative, he needs an outpatient MRI. Case number three is that snowboarder that fell and did a trick and he's tender at L1, L2 and has a little bit of abdominal tenderness as well. So he's got traumatic, severe, low back pain without neurologic symptoms. So he's got a lumbar compression fracture until proven otherwise, right? Remember, we're gonna x-ray our T and our L spine because they like to live in that T spine as well. And he actually has a T12 and L1 compression fracture on x-ray. We're gonna give it, get a CT because he has a 50% loss of height and I'm concerned that he's got more columns injured than just one. And he's also got some abdominal pain and there's risk of intra-abdominal injury. And case number four was this cancer patient who came in with rib pain and no bowel movement in five days and some difficulty ambulating and some weakness in her right leg. So she's got cauda equina until proven otherwise, right? She's got a cancer history, she's got constipation, she's got some weakness. So she gets a post void residual, she gets a rectal uh, saddle exam and a stat MRI. And we're gonna do the T and the L spine because of her history of cancer. And then we'll go into surgical options, radiation treatment, et cetera. But time is nerve, so this has to happen stat. So take home points. If you do a good history and physical, you can figure out the diagnosis without advanced imaging most of the time. A few things require stat imaging or surgery, so find that needle in the haystack. Narrow down your differential based on back pain alone or back and leg pain, trauma overuse or atraumatic. With fractures, often CT is needed to evaluate the columns and to make sure there's no other concomitant injuries. Don't forget about the thoracic spine, cancer and compression fracture, fractures like to live there. And you will see cauda equina if you haven't yet. Uh, post void residual is helpful. Ask about sexual dysfunction. Um, check for saddle anesthesia and time is nerve, so make the diagnosis early.